Welcome to this video presentation entitled Becoming an Arbitrator. I'm Howard T. Spence. I am an attorney and also an arbitrator. I am presently on several arbitration panels, including panels for the American Arbitration Association and FINRA. I also do mediation in the state of Michigan as a civil circuit court mediator. In addition, I do consulting and management and in employment relations issues. I also occasionally teach. I have taught basic business law courses, employment law courses, discrimination law courses, and also human resource courses in the MBA program offered by the University of Phoenix. In addition, I have served as an adjunct professor of law at the Thomas Cooley Law School in Lansing, Michigan. In my prior professional experience, I worked 30 years for the state of Michigan in a number of positions, including the position of Deputy Insurance Commissioner for the state of Michigan. I ended my service with the state of Michigan during a 10-year period in which I was an administrative law judge, hearing a wide variety of cases in the state of Michigan. I presently perform my arbitration and mediation practice through Black Gold Associates LLC. Black Gold Associates LLC is a corporation which I own and operate. This particular video presentation is one of a series which I have recently put together dealing with various topics which relate to the alternate dispute resolution profession. In particular, this series has focused on issues and information relating to the profession of arbitration. This series of arbitration related videos and this presentation in particular is dedicated with appreciation to the Honorable Harry T. Edwards, who is former Chief Judge of the District of Columbia Federal Circuit Court, and also to the Honorable A. Leon Higginbotham, who is a former judge of the United States Court of Appeals for the Third Circuit. I first met Judge Edwards when he was a professor of law at the University of Michigan during the time when I was a student. I took several labor and employment law courses from Professor Edwards. Professor Edwards inspired me and many other individuals at that time inasmuch as he was one of the very first black arbitrators who was appointed to and served on the American Arbitration Association panels during the 1970s. Professor Higginbotham was a visiting lecturer who came to the University of Michigan during the time when I was a student there in their law school and Professor Higginbotham delivered several lectures dealing with the topic of race and its impact on the legal and adjudication system. I am forever grateful and appreciative of these two individuals who have provided me with guidance and inspiration to pursue my own interests in the law and my own interests in adjudication. I also want to give special thanks to Professor Floyd Weatherspoon of Capital University Law School in Columbus, Ohio. Professor Weatherspoon teaches and is in charge of the alternate dispute resolution program offered through Capital University Law School. Professor Weatherspoon also has, for the past 10 years, directed an annual conference and symposium in Columbus at the law school, which has had as its focus introduction to the profession of arbitration and mediation. And that particular series of symposia and conferences have been targeted towards the general proposition of increasing minority and female participation in the alternate dispute resolution profession. This particular video presentation 
and the several other video presentations which I have already published and left online on the internet derive in part from a suggestion from Professor Weatherspoon that I prepare and present a series of workshops or topics during the Capital University Law School annual minority ADR conference. I appreciate that task which was assigned to me and feedback from the students and participants in, in those classes as well as from Professor Weatherspoon have caused me to realize that perhaps this topic is of greater interest than just for those individuals who were in attendance at that annual conference. Therefore, this particular video presentation is again dedicated and given with thanks to those individuals who have inspired me and who have encouraged me in this area. I want to start out by saying that every judge has an opinion. As a former administrative law judge, I probably have many opinions. I want to indicate, first of all, that the opinions which are expressed in this presentation are just that, my opinions. And they are not necessarily the opinions of any arbitration panel or association on which I serve, nor are they necessarily the opinion of any other arbitrator. I acknowledge that some of my observations or opinions may not be absolutely correct, or that they may be questioned by others, and I'm always open to discussion and reconsideration of my opinions and the positions I take in this presentation. This particular video presentation dealing with the topic of becoming an arbitrator derives in part from my own experience. Shortly after graduating from law school during the late 1970s, I decided that I wanted to become an arbitrator, and I began at that time to seek admission to the profession. And although the profession has probably changed considerably over the 30 or 40 years since I graduated from law school, I realized at that time that there was not a wealth of information available to me about what was the process for becoming an arbitrator. And I struggled for a while, and then I began my state service. And after my retirement from state service as an administrative law judge, I went back and I decided that at that point, I would start a second career, not as a state bureaucrat, but as an arbitrator. At that point in time, I realized that there still was a relative dearth of information about the process for becoming an arbitrator and how one went about becoming an arbitrator. I am putting this presentation together in hopes that it will be helpful to others who are actually aspiring to become arbitrators or to become involved in the alternate dispute resolution profession. I'm especially hopeful that this particular presentation will encourage people who are of color and females, minorities, as well as others, to want to consider this particular profession of being a professional arbitrator. In this video presentation, I discuss generally the qualifications which are required to become an arbitrator. I also will be sharing some of the actual experiences I have had related to my application for appointment to the American Arbitration Labor Panel. I think that by the time we conclude this video presentation today, you will understand and agree with me that there are actually quite a few hoops to jump through before one can get to be an arbitrator and assigned to an arbitration panel. The business of arbitration is set up in a way that in order to become successful as an arbitrator, many times an individual needs to have an association or agency which will refer that arbitrator out as a candidate for appointment on some of the disputes which do arise. Generally, arbitrators get work assignments by becoming a member 
of an association or agency panel, or sometimes it's called a roster of arbitrators. There are major associations and minor associations which perform the task of maintaining rosters of arbitrators and referring out potential arbitrators to candidates who approach those associations seeking help and recommended arbitrators. Some of the associations or agencies which serve by providing panels of arbitrators have more specialized or niche client markets for their arbitrator placements. One of the first steps that a person might want to do in terms of entering into the profession of being an arbitrator is to contact associations which maintain these panels for access from the associations directly about the requirements and processes for becoming appointed to the panel. The major arbitration associations which I am familiar with and which would be probably good for initial contacts would be the American Arbitration Association, the Federal Mediation Conciliation Service, and also FINRA. There are also numerous other associations out there for consideration for potential affiliations. Examples of some of the other associations would be JAMS, uh, the National Arbitration uh, Foundation, and also Resolute Systems LLC. These are only a few of the possible associations or organizations which might be contacted for information about processes particular to their own panels that they maintain. A very large part of the arbitration work assignments which an arbitrator would hope to get actually come from the major associations when they send out referrals for members of the panels that they maintain. An aspiring arbitrator can Google or do an internet search to obtain the names and websites of a large number of some of the smaller arbitration associations or providers or those who maintain and work in niche markets. I want to talk for a moment about getting on these association panels, staying on them, and also about leaving an association panel. I would start out by indicating that acceptance to one of the association panels or rosters is not a guarantee of acceptance by any other association. Indeed, for a number of years I have been on the American Arbitration Association panel for employment law arbitrators, and I was also and still am on the American Arbitration Association panel which they maintain for commercial law arbitrators. However, being on those two panels for arbitrators which were maintained by the American Arbitration Association did not assure me of being admitted or placed on the American Arbitration Association panel for labor arbitrators. And that is merely an example of the fact that there is a difference of requirements which these associations would uh, impose upon applicants depending on the subject matter of the arbitration and also depending on the particular criteria of an association compared to or vis-a-vis -vis other associations. After an arbitrator gets established and has developed a following and people know his or her work, after they get known to potential clients, sometimes an arbitrator will actually resign from one or more association panels. And at that point, the arbitrator may rely more on direct requests from parties for the arbitrator to handle cases that those particular parties would have from time to time. One of the reasons that an arbitrator might resign from an association panel when that arbitrator started to get sufficient work otherwise would be the fact that these arbitration panels do require ongoing fees to be paid by the arbitrator just to remain in good standing on those panels and to get referrals. If an arbitrator is not getting a large volume of arbitration referrals from one particular association or panel, then the arbitrator might make a cost-benefit analysis and decide 
after the arbitrator is somewhat established that the amount or volume of income from that association panel did not justify the costs which were associated on an annual basis with remaining on the panel. In addition to arbitrators voluntarily leaving these association panels, sometimes the associations themselves will remove or fire an arbitrator from membership on an association panel or roster. Associations may remove an arbitrator from membership on one of their panels for a number of reasons. Sometimes an association will let an arbitrator go or exclude the arbitrator from membership on a panel based on the fact that the arbitrator has for a considerable period of time not been selected by a party through the association even though the arbitrator's name may have been referred out for consideration for appointment by parties for an extended period of time. Associations would therefore decide that for whatever reason the clientele of the association, the claimants, those who buy or use arbitrator services don't find a particular arbitrator to be attractive and given that particular conclusion the association would notify the arbitrator that the arbitrator is no longer going to be a member in good standing on the panel or referred out for consideration for future appointments by that particular association. There are other types of associations or providers of arbitrators beyond the private sector uh, arbitration panels which we have just discussed. Sometimes the government, whether it's state or federal, will hire, utilize, or actually even refer arbitrators out to third parties for arbitration assignments. I myself am on a grievance arbitration panel which is maintained by the Michigan Employment Relations Commission, which is a state agency. Arbitrators assigned to that particular agency panel will be referred out when and if there are requests for arbitrators, which would come either from uh, disputes between school districts and their unions. Sometimes they will even refer out grievance arbitrators for private sector disputes. But basically, uh, the point to be made is that there are other uh, venues uh, or methods for arbitrators to find work and to find entry into the arbitration profession besides or in addition to the associations or panels which are maintained by the major or minor private sector arbitration referral associations. I mentioned the Michigan Employment Relations Commission. I think it's true that there are a number of states that maintain statutory agencies to oversee the arbitration process for public employee disputes and for government related disputes. Recently there has developed the phenomenon of internet or online based dispute resolution services. Those services are beginning to utilize the services of arbitrators. Basically the main difference between those dispute resolution services and the more traditional dispute resolution services such as the American Arbitration Association, FINRA, the Federal Mediation and Conciliation Service is that the parties to the dispute can submit their cases online electronically and the arbitrator would then review the case, any evidence or, or documentation that the parties provide and make a decision and issue a decision right there in the online or virtual uh, environment. I think that is a natural evolution which we will see as a result of people becoming more and more used to interacting through the internet rather than in face-to-face -face situations. Finally, another source of potential employment for arbitrators derives from the fact that many industries or large employers and even some unions maintain their own regular panels of arbitrators or umpires. Those particular industries or employers generally are large enough that they have an ongoing need for arbitrators 
or mediators for that fact, and over time they become familiar with certain arbitrators or mediators, they like their work and the results which derive from the work of those arbitrators or mediators, and they then begin to approach those arbitrators or mediators directly on almost a contractual or uh, employment type situation to handle cases and disputes as they arise. Getting on panels. Actually, the vacancies on panels at the present time seem to be few and far between. In fact, some people would go so far as to say that there is no vacancy on those panels for prospective or potential arbitrators. And that, of course, has significant implications for individuals who want to become arbitrators. Uh, it becomes much more difficult to become an arbitrator if there are fewer venues or avenues, rather, for actual entry into the profession through appointments through these panels. It's also generally acknowledged by most of the ADR associations that the composition of these panels is somewhat skewed demographically and reflects the history and tradition that has been realized. In many cases, the ADR profession uh, over time uh, has been one that has not had many minorities or women involved professionally. And the arbitration profession is such that many of the arbitrators who entered the profession 10, 20, 30 years ago are actually still in the profession providing arbitration services. And given the fact that there is little turnover among arbitrators in these panels and in the profession generally, it becomes much more difficult for those individuals who are seeking to enter the profession. And it also has some significant adverse uh, implications for the profession itself in terms of the movement to have this particular profession become more diversified. The associations recognize that they underutilize minorities and women as arbitrators and also as mediators, and they give lip service to wanting to make this profession more diverse, but some of the logistics of the demand and supply for arbitrators makes it difficult for the associations to show any significant or great success in terms of helping the industry move further toward diversity. Another result of the fact that there has been low turnover in these panels, uh, besides the fact that it's more difficult to get on the panels, or perhaps related to the fact that it's more difficult to get on the panels, is that the standards for appointment to these panels, uh, those standards have risen, and in fact, they have become extremely high. So individuals who may have qualified for or been able to get on panels as arbitrators 20 years ago may find today that with the same credentials, the same experience, they would not likely be accepted or appointed to some of the major panels uh, and referred out. These associations or agencies are businesses, and they work very hard to give their arbitration clients who and what they want when they are trying to select or refer arbitrators from the association panels. In other words, in order for these associations to be successful in their mission of providing these services to the claimants or individuals and employers and corporations who become involved in these disputes, it becomes necessary that the associations maintain rosters of attractive arbitration clients. To a certain degree, these associations actually compete between and among themselves for this arbitration business. And as much as they perhaps want to encourage uh, turnover entry into the profession of newbies or diversification of the profession, there are these business constraints uh, which impact upon their behavior so that they actually have not been very aggressive in terms of dealing with this turnover issue and not very aggressive in terms of dealing with taking actions which would accelerate the movement of these particular 
claimants or clients toward utilizing a more diverse arbitrator population. What is the role of the professional arbitrator? I like to think that the role of the professional arbitrator is the role of any adjudicator. It's to be a judge. And in fact, many times, arbitrators are referred to as private judges or judges for hire. And the work that is expected, uh, the work product that is expected from arbitrators uh, is similar to the work product that is expected from a judge in a regular court of general jurisdiction. An arbitrator serves as a neutral and impartial fact finder and also as a decision maker in disputes. An arbitrator must control the hearing process and must develop a hearing record. And finally, an arbitrator must issue a reasoned and thoughtful decision or award following a hearing. Arbitrators are often called umpires or referees. In fact, in some private sector situations where industries maintain their own panels of arbitrators, the arbitrators are called just that, umpires. The skill set of an arbitrator that he uses to deal with uh, recalcitrant and aggressive parties often differs significantly from the skill set which would be used by a mediator. And in fact, uh, as we go through this presentation, you will see that some of the arbitration associations are concerned that individuals who are making recommendations for arbitrators to be placed on their panel reflect on that and recognize that they are seeking people who are decision makers as opposed to mediators. Mediators tend to utilize skill sets which help them to uh, be an intermediary between parties. To uh, It helps them to be able to uh, facilitate discussion and settlement uh, between parties. And by and large, arbitrators are actually decision makers. So associations selecting arbitrators are aware of the fact that a good mediator is not necessarily going to be a good arbitrator and vice versa. Again, arbitrators are decision makers. They must make fair and impartial calls and they have to get it right most of the time. Arbitrators are human. Certainly arbitrators will make decisions which sometimes may be suspect or which the parties may think are inappropriate or wrong, but if an arbitrator consistently or on a regular basis fails to get it right, then that arbitrator probably won't get requested or appointed very often by parties. And more than likely that arbitrator will not be successful and that arbitrator will eventually be excluded from the panels and will have allowed himself to be put out of the profession just based on the fact that no one wants to utilize his or her services for decision making, especially when they're dealing with cases and issues of great significance to the parties. Many times the work of an arbitrator is simply to resolve disputes between the parties about the meaning and application of language which is either in a statute or a contract provision. Arbitrators are selected and get their authority pursuant to a contract or collective bargaining agreement. Sometimes the collective bargaining agreements or contracts may spell out the basic requirements of that particular situation for the arbitrator that is qualified to actually handle that case. When I started out to prepare this presentation, I did take a look at the internet to see what information was available on the internet, what sort of advice was already on the internet uh, that addressed the issue of how to become an arbitrator. And if you look uh, aggressively, you will find that there are some articles, comments, postings, which 
attempt to deal with the issue of how does one become an arbitrator. So they're, they're out there, and I found a couple. Uh, for example, I came across an article entitled How to Become an Arbitrator in Illinois, and it was written by an individual named David Carnes. And I, I read that uh, particular uh, article or Internet posting with interest. The United States Bureau of Labor Statistics predicts that there will be a 14% growth in the need for arbitrators, mediators, and conciliators between 2008 and 2018. So this is potentially a growth industry, uh, the industry of alternate dispute resolution. Statistics, which are also published by the Bureau of Labor Statistics, indicates that at the present time in the United States, there are approximately 10,000 individuals who report that their profession or work is that of an arbitrator, mediator, or conciliator. I did not capture the statistic about the total number of arbitrators, but I'm sure it's out there on the internet. Uh, I did look on one of the uh, websites for a provider of arbitrators, the Federal Mediation and Conciliation Service, and from their website, one can get the impression that they utilize perhaps about 1,500 uh, distinct arbitrators for the work that they do refer out. But in any case, a growth profession, and we're also looking at the fact that there is beginning to be some turnover among the arbitrators who have been on those panels for some time. So the issue of how to become an arbitrator actually becomes more significant now because it may be more feasible for individuals to get into this profession. The article which I read uh, by Mr. Carnes also indicated that there were several universities in Illinois that offered arbitration degrees. And this is true to a certain extent uh, in a number of states. Uh, in Michigan, I know we actually have uh, three or four human resource oriented programs which actually have components which I would characterize as arbitration uh, training components. Uh, one such institution is Michigan State University School of Labor and Industrial Relations, and that's where I got uh, my master's degree in labor industrial relations. I also noticed that Grand Valley State University uh, has a strong arbitration component, and in fact they maintain a website of resources for individuals who either aspire to become arbitrators, who want to actually look at the resumes and vita of a large number of individuals who are in the arbitration profession uh, nationwide and in particular in uh, Michigan. Uh, Wayne State University also offers uh, a component which deals with arbitration and labor industrial relations. And I'm sure there are others, but the point to be made is that at the academic level, a number of universities across the nation is starting to realize that there is a potential for marketing and training arbitrators. Indeed, Professor Weatherspoon, uh, who I mentioned during the credits and thanks, is the director of a program which leads to arbitration degrees and training at the Capital University Law School in Columbus, Ohio. Another statement which I found in the internet article by David Carnes was that he considered the difficulty of becoming an arbitrator to be moderately challenging. Perhaps uh, from my perspective it could be more than moderately challenging, but we'll address that as we proceed with this presentation. So, how to become an arbitrator. What's suggested on the internet is first you determine the type of arbitration to pursue. And I think that's good advice. The field of arbitration is very broad. Some arbitrations focus on subject matter or issues which are related to labor, some to uh, employment. And then there's this broad area called commercial law or commercial arbitrations. Arbitrations can be in almost any area of dispute and reflect almost all areas of, of human occupation. For example, sometimes there are contractual disputes which arise out of engineering 
situations or disputes. Somebody may be suing someone else because of the way that a building was constructed or failed or whatever. And that particular type of arbitration would require a certain type of expertise. And the approach of arbitrators from one subject area to another may differ significantly. And also the amount of interest that a person might have in a subject matter might, different, uh, might differ uh, from uh, subject matter to subject matter. So it's pretty uh, good advice, pretty sound advice to say, if you have an inkling to know what interests you already, determine the type of arbitration that you wish to pursue. Obtain a BA in arbitration. Well, arbitration is a profession. Uh, historically, many of the people who have been uh, successful arbitrators may not have even had a bachelor's degree. I'm sure most did historically, but today in order to uh, have the credibility to uh, be on a panel or to be accepted by parties, I think it goes without saying that they're looking for people who have a professional background which has come to be synonymous today with people who have at least a college education at the bachelor's level. The advice out there uh, suggests that you should then proceed to complete a second major or grad degree in a specialty area. Well, uh, certainly that is uh, commendable and I don't disagree with that if your circumstances allow it, but again, that is not necessarily actually uh, uh, a prerequisite to becoming an arbitrator or to being a, su a successful arbitrator. Uh, it's something that would enhance your credentials and make it more likely that a party or a pair of parties might select you to hear their case. Work in a chosen field for several years. Now, I indicated that when I got out of law school back in the late 70s, I wanted to be an arbitrator. And one of the uh, obstacles that I ran into in that uh, pursuit of that type of profession was that I did not have what a lot of associations at the time would consider to be uh, a broad base of experience that would be attractive to uh, clients or claimants who would be seeking arbitrators. And to a certain extent, that was true. Uh, right out of law school, I was a young lawyer. I thought I was relatively bright. I probably was at a high energy level, but I did not necessarily have some of the experience which would temper my decisions. And I think many times you'll find that people who want to utilize the services of an arbitrator want to have somebody with experience and with maturity. And we'll talk a bit about that as the presentation goes on. So the suggestion that you should have worked in a chosen field for several years, it has some merit uh, and it should be considered when you as an aspiring arbitrator are considering whether or not you want to go into the business. Do you think that you would have experience that would be of, of great value uh, to individuals hiring you to do their work as an arbitrator. Complete an arbitration certification course. Well, even if you don't enroll specifically in a curriculum which results in a certification as an arbitrator, before you get referred out, especially by one of the major associations or panels, you may have to go through the certification process of that association. In other words, almost all the associations require individuals who are admitted to the panels or rosters that they maintain to become involved in training. And some of that training is a sufficient amount and nature that it probably would allow the issuance of a certificate or certification uh, to be an arbitrator. And finally, what you find out there on the uh, internet when you look is the suggestion that you should join an arbitration panel. And I, I think that's probably a good piece of advice, assuming that you can join a panel and assuming that you can get on a panel. Arbitrators are not licensed. Although this is a profession, there generally is not, to my knowledge, any requirement that you actually go through what I would call a licensing process. Some states do maintain lists of approved arbitrators which they 
provide to parties that are seeking the services of an arbitrator, and they may require or refer to that as registration, but those generally are not what I would call licensing. Individuals who are already arbitrators uh, can generally function in those states or locations, even though they may not meet a specific set of criteria, especially if they have the history and experience of being successful as arbitrators in other locations. Actually, arbitrators can just hang up their shingles to practice. Uh, that's rare, and a part of the reason it's rare is that if you're a newbie and you're in and you suddenly announce to the world, I'm an arbitrator, that's not really likely to result in much work for you unless you are well known otherwise, or unless you have friends and positions who can send work to you so that you can make a livelihood in this profession. So in order to be a lawyer, for example, you have to be licensed. You have to jump through a, a very extensive series of hoops, including three or four years of, of uh, post graduate education, but arbitrators don't have that generic re, uh, requirement. And so I assume that if you want to be an arbitrator, you could hang up that shingle, open your practice, uh, and announce to the world either on the internet or for that matter, uh, any other media that you are an arbitrator and that you are capable and want to help them by adjudicating their cases. I'm not very optimistic that that type of uh, approach would generate any business for you, uh, especially in the arbitration practice that I'm aware of, where many of the outcomes of arbitration are just so significant to the parties that they don't want to take a chance on signing their work to someone who is incompetent, a shyster, or otherwise not really capable of giving a quality product for the arbitration service uh, that these particular parties need. Most arbitration assignments and work results from referrals from one of the major arbitration service associations. And again, uh, I'm mentioning uh, the American Arbitration Association, FINRA, the Federal Mediation Conciliation Services as examples of major arbitration service associations. Among these associations, there is sometimes a certain degree of competition. They're all trying to get work in terms of having users of arbitration services come to them for referrals because there are fees generated and, and that's basically a part of the mission of these arbitration associations. And so there's this internal within the industry competition and you will find the situation where some arbitration associations attempt to be one up on the competition by indicating that they only have the most qualified arbitrators. And this within the industry or intra-industry competition also has a tendency over time of raising the credentials as well as the uh, entry requirements for arbitrators. Some arbitration associations only want to utilize on their panels arbitrators with the most stellar credentials. I should point out that there are some state laws uh, which deal with arbitrations and arbitrators generally. Although arbitrators are not licensed or directly regulated generally by government agencies, most states, in fact, have enacted laws dealing with the arbitration process. And occasionally, those statutes or laws will have some indication of requirements or limitations for arbitrators. A good place to begin when you are considering entering into the arbitration profession is to take at least a quick look at the arbitration statutes in your state or jurisdiction. Look at those statutes and see if there's anything in those statutes which would impact upon your prospects for becoming an arbitrator in that state or jurisdiction. You don't have to be a lawyer to be an arbitrator. Many arbitrators are lawyers. There seems to be a trend or tendency for new arbitrators or persons entering into the profession to actually be lawyers, but again, it's not a prerequisite at this time to becoming an arbitrator. 
Individuals who are not actually licensed as lawyers can learn the information and techniques which are used by lawyers which relate to interpreting contracts, uh, doing dispute resolution, and also hearing control management. In other words, what I'm saying is that a person can learn the same thing as lawyers without actually having taking, taken the full law school curriculum and without actually having gone through the process of becoming licensed as lawyers. Many of the ADR programs which are maintained at universities and colleges will provide degrees, whether undergrad or graduate, in ADR, and a part of the curriculum at those schools would be training the students in these particular skills and knowledges. Parties to arbitrations will often focus on using arbitrators who have lawyer-like skills and or expertise related to the industry in which these parties operate. It's just as likely, or perhaps even more likely, that a party seeking an arbitrator, especially in an industry which is somewhat unique, would be looking for someone who might understand the industry itself. And to a certain extent, that may be one of the criteria that parties look at when they are trying to find someone to resolve their dispute. Not only can they handle the hearing, present lawyer-like skills, but do they have any knowledge about my industry or the problems that I'm likely to be facing or that we are likely to be discussing in the grievance process of a particular case. Historically and even today, many arbitrators have professional backgrounds in academia or in specialized technical areas. I think earlier I mentioned that some of the information I found on the internet suggested that it was moderately difficult to get on a panel for one of these arbitration associations. I would suggest that it's really not that easy to get on a major arbitration panel. For example, both the American Arbitration Association and the Federal Mediation Conciliation Service have standards that can be pretty stringent for screening out applicants who are attempting to get on those arbitration panels. In order to assure that there is a minimum amount of arbitration work for arbitrators who are already on their panels, the major panels have not really been that aggressive in recruiting new arbitrators in the recent past. Arbitrator vacancies occur as arbitrators begin to retire, die, or become unable to write decisions or get selected for arbitration appointments. It appears that as a result of changes in the demographics and aging, that opportunities to replace retiring arbitrators may be increasing in the next decade. I want to turn my focus and attention for just a, a brief moment to some of the costs of becoming an arbitrator. There are, in fact, upcoming costs that the aspiring arbitrator needs to be aware of and would confront during the process of trying to become an arbitrator and probably even after becoming an arbitrator um, while that arbitrator is trying to develop skills and to develop a practice. So becoming an arbitrator can be expensive. You may have costs associated with education and training, uh, particularly entry-level costs. I think it goes without saying that a prerequisite to becoming an arbitrator would at least be a bachelor's degree and likely uh, postgraduate training either as a lawyer or in one of the training programs that's focusing on alternate dispute resolution. There are sometimes application fees and panel costs. Even if an association does not require an applicant to file uh, an application fee, if that particular applicant is successful in getting appointed to a panel, 
most of the associations require the new arbitrator uh, to begin paying on an annual basis panel fees, which could be several hundred dollars a year. Uh, I think, for example, the American Arbitration Association charges between $400 and $500 a year for arbitrators to pay for panel costs. And that can be a significant expenditure, especially if you're not getting a large number or significant number of cases referred to you from that particular association. As I indicated earlier in the presentation, over time, some arbitrators even drop off panels because it does not become a cost-effective investment for them to remain there. They're getting work, uh, if they're getting it at all, from outside of those associations to a degree that that is where their livelihood is and the costs and expenses of maintaining the status of being on a major arbitration association panel can become significant. Sometimes there would be fees that are required to be certified or placed on registries of arbitrators. Those fees could be statutory or depending on the industry uh, or the situation, those fees could be paid to some other third party entity. There are also costs associated with getting the necessary experience. Almost all of the associations require that in order to be considered for appointment as arbitrators on their panels, you have to show a certain degree of experience already in the field of arbitration. And especially for someone who is trying to enter into the profession and who has not already been established on uh, another panel or association panel prior to this application, it sometimes is problematic uh, to get the required experience to meet that threshold for getting your own first panel appointment. And sometimes that would result in a potential arbitrator following someone as a mentee. And in that situation, sitting through hearings, uh, discussing a matter with the actual arbitrator, uh, maybe sometimes even taking stabs at trying to assist the arbitrator with resolving the disputes. All of this investment of time as well as travel expense to do the shadowing or to uh, get this necessary expense, this is also a potential cost for entry into the profession of arbitration. There also are office maintenance costs and potentially a significant amount of networking costs that would be involved as you try to get into this profession in any sort of substantial way. As we'll see when we look at some of the qualifications and also the procedure for getting into the industry of being a professional arbitrator, sometimes you need to know someone. And getting to know someone uh, who will either vouch for you or even utilize you for arbitration work requires getting out there and doing a considerable amount of networking so that people can become familiar with who you are and obtain a, an image in their mind as to your qualifications to handle this type of work, not only for them, but for others. And again, both before you get on a panel as an arbitrator and after, there are travel expenses, which you may realize. Some of those travel expenses, of course, would be reimbursable, but some would not and that could potentially be a significant consideration. Competition sometimes works against diversity in the profession, and I think I've already alluded to that. Arbitrators who are already in the arbitration profession, sometimes they hesitate to help newbies get into the profession. And this has an adverse impact on all potential arbitrators, but a side product of that problem is the fact that if newbies are having difficulties getting into this profession, then minorities and females are likely also having difficulty getting into the profession. And therefore, the goal of making the profession a more diverse profession would be thwarted. It becomes more difficult because, in part, there's this competition factor. Many established arbitrators are already just too busy uh, to contribute time and effort uh, to mentor or assist others 
seeking to enter the profession. That is one consideration. And possibly another consideration, which may or may not be verbalized, is the fact that there may be some fear or reluctance uh, by those already who are in the profession about recommending or being associated even with someone who is not stellar. In other words, people come to you and they're seeking uh, you to recommend them for consideration, for appointment to a panel, or uh, someone calls to ask you about Joe and, and what you think he would be like as an arbitrator. And to a certain extent, especially if you don't know Joe or Susie very well, you may hesitate to putting your own personal reputation out there to possibly be tarnished by someone who may disappoint you and the parties to whom you have referred them or recommended them. Now, associations require applicants to demonstrate professionalism, and we're going to see that when we look at the criteria for uh, getting into, these, into this industry. Arbitrations and aspiring arbitrators should demonstrate professionalism, and they can do that in their education, as we've already discussed. I think there's pretty much a need for them to become involved and to demonstrate continuing education. There is constantly something to learn, particularly if you are dealing with a subject matter that's impacted by the law, which can change over time. You have to demonstrate your professionalism or attempts to enhance your professionalism by becoming involved in social and professional networking. Your professionalism is demonstrated or directly correlated with your ability to show maturity, your ability to show reliability, and by showing integrity and honesty. In other words, your reputation is a significant part of your professionalism, and it would have an impact not only on whether or not an association would consider you for appointment to their rosters or panels, but also after you are an arbitrator, it would impact on the decision-making process of potential parties who would be deciding whether or not they wanted to select you to be the arbitrator in a case that they had. I think many times this professionalism, especially for arbitrators or judges or adjudicators generally, is that you can demonstrate your professionalism by showing what is characterized as a judicial temperament and deportment. The various arbitration associations do have their own requirements and they typically will publish these requirements in some location where you as an aspiring uh, arbitrator can find them. A good place to start your journey towards becoming an arbitrator? Well, visit the websites which are maintained by some of the major associations and take a look and see what you find there about their listing uh, and discussion of their qualifications and their need for arbitrators. You see now on the screen the uh, website on the internet for the American Arbitration Association, www.adr.org. Here is the website for the Federal Mediation Conciliation Service, www.fmcs.gov. And here is the website address for FINRA, www.finra.org. Visits to one or all of those sites will give you a lot of insight in terms of what you might have to do to become an arbitrator, at least to get appointed to panels that these associations maintain. It actually, when all is said and done, sometimes it's pretty difficult or hard to get on an American Arbitration Association panel. And it apparently is getting harder and harder as time goes by. In fact, if you look at some of the literature that the American Arbitration Association puts out, they're pretty candid, candid about the difficulty which a potential arbitrator might find. The American Arbitration Association states that openings on their panels are extremely limited. 
They further go on to state that selection for membership on their panels is based upon the American Arbitration Association caseload needs and also user preferences. And I think that is one way that they would be saying that if there's not enough work, we're not going to be considering applicants. And if a particular applicant or type of applicant brings criteria or characteristics which we can't sell or market to our users, to the individuals who are seeking arbitrator referrals from us, then we're probably not going to want you or consider you for our panels. A final statement that the American Arbitration Association makes about the application process for new candidates to become associated with uh, AAA uh, is, well, they state even candidates with strong credentials may not be added to AAA rosters. And I think that kind of supports or underscores a part of the thesis I've raised that over time the uh, criteria for admission to these panels has raised. It has gotten to the point now where even if you're qualified to be an arbitrator or qualified to be a good arbitrator, your qualifications or your credentials may not be sufficient to get you on one of these association panels. Similarly, the Federal Mediation Conciliation Service states uh, about uh, roster members uh, on their website the following information. In order to get on an FMCS roster, you have to be experienced, competent, and acceptable. And that acceptability, again, is a reference to the fact that the parties who utilize arbitrators need to be comfortable in considering you for appointment to their cases. The FMCS further goes on to say that applicants need to have extensive and recent experience and in relevant positions and at least at M, uh, FMCS they emphasize in collective bargaining because they focus considerably on the labor side as compared to, for example, the commercial arbitration side. And a third point that FMCS makes on their website is that applicants for their rosters have to be capable of conducting an orderly hearing. They have to be able to analyze testimony and exhibits, and they have to be able to write clear and concise decisions. And they have to be able to do it in a timely manner. So that's a general overall philosophy which describes the standards for admission to the FMCS panel or roster. In addition to meeting those general criteria, FMCS requires that applicants for their panels submit five satisfactory recent labor arbitration awards. In other words, FMCS is really only interested in considering applicants who already have a sufficient experience in the field. This, if you read between the lines, is another way of saying no matter how skilled or talented or intelligent you are, we're really only going to accept people to our roster who have demonstrated that they have experience and that they can be an arbitrator. To already have these five satisfactory recent labor arbitration awards would indicate that you have already been working as an arbitrator. One thing that you will note when you look at the FMCS criteria for appointment to the FMCS arbitrator panels is the fact that FMCS will reduce the number of labor arbitration awards or decisions required for applicants to be appointed to their panels if the applicant has recently completed the FMCS labor arbitrator training course. And I have to say I've taken the FMCS labor training course. When I took it, it was a five-day course, uh, 40 hours approximately, and it was a very thorough and very good course, and it's certainly worthwhile. It's not a cheap undertaking to take that particular training course. Uh, the tuition alone uh, can be quite substantial. Uh, it also is a very worthwhile investment, I think, if you're going to get work 
as an arbitrator generally. It teaches you things even if you are an experienced arbitrator. FMCS is not alone in terms of providing training opportunities. Some of the other associations go out of their way to provide a broad range of training opportunities for arbitrators. And in fact, as a part of the continuing arbitration education requirements of some of the associations, arbitrators who are already accepted on their panels will still need to, on a regular basis, enroll in, pay for, and successfully complete some of these arbitration training courses which are offered from time to time and which are necessary to stay on the panels in good standing. The FMCS requirements also point to the fact that they are looking for individuals that have extensive and recent experience in collective bargaining again, highlighting the focus on labor types of issues. This would also be true of the American Arbitration Association Labor Arbitration Panel. They will highlight and focus on experience in collective bargaining, but labor arbitration is actually only one of several different types of arbitration interests that the American Arbitration Association uh, gets involved in. They take a moment and look at a publication of the American Arbitration Association, which highlights uh, and identifies qualifications that they expect for individuals who are admitted to their national roster of arbitrators. And as you look at these qualifications, I think you would probably agree with me that these qualifications are not necessarily easy qualifications to meet. And they also show that we are probably looking only at individuals who have been around a while and who are mature and responsible. So the qualifications, A, a minimum of 10 years of senior level business or professional experience or legal practice. Now, if you're talking about 10 years of legal practice or whatever, you're talking about somebody who already has a substantial amount of professional experience. B, they're looking for educational degrees and professional licenses which are appropriate to the field of expertise. So if they are looking at commercial arbitrators uh, who might be doing arbitrations relating to engineering, civil engineering, whatever, then they probably are looking for individuals who have an educational background in engineering as well as any other training which would make them acceptable as arbitrators or decision makers otherwise. To be qualified for appointment to the AAA panel, you have to persuade them that you have sufficient honors, awards, and citations to be a leader in your field. So it's kind of like we only want the best, which is commendable, I suspect, but it also makes it more difficult for someone who wants to be admitted into this profession to jump through that hoop to meet that hurdle. AAA is looking for some training or experience in arbitration or other forms of dispute resolution. What you will often find, not only with AAA, but with some of the other major associations, is that they will have arbitrator members on their panels who in previous professional lives may have even been judges. Uh, sometimes judges and lawyers retire. In fact, arbitration is a special type of profession in that it has a large number of part-time uh, individuals involved in the practice of arbitration. And once they have retired, uh, perhaps from being a judge or whatever uh, profession that they primarily earn their living in, they want to become an arbitrator. And so they bring a considerable amount of experience. And uh, some of that experience is in dispute resolution itself because, hey, they were the judge. E, membership in professional associations. This is an indicator not only of your seriousness uh, toward civic uh, duties, but also uh, an indication of your involvement in your professional community. And it also will be a secondary indicator of the seriousness with which you have uh, pursued your profession. If you're a lawyer, certainly they would want to know what legal associations or organizations you've been associated with and possibly 
uh, how that has impacted on you. In the labor arbitration area, they might be interested to know were you involved in any of the uh, human resources or labor relations association, uh, such as perhaps the Labor Employment Relations Association. This type of information would be considered as a part of your meeting the qualifications for admission into the arbitration profession, at least by the uh, American Arbitration Association. And then finally, F, they throw in the qualification of other relevant experience or accomplishments, and they suggest published articles. And, and I think this is consistent with the fact that sometimes you will find arbitrators who come from academia and they are distinguished in their fields and they're very knowledgeable and a part of that knowledge and experience is reflected in the publication that they would would do as a professional educator or for that matter perhaps as an attorney or jurist. Triple A suggests that you need to be judge-like and again they're looking for neutrality, they're looking for what they call judicial capacity, and they're looking for reputation. And this is certainly something that is of concern to the associations, your reputation. Uh, they are looking at AAA for people who are held in highest regard um, by peers for integrity, fairness, or good judgment. If there is something in your past which is obvious, which calls into question your integrity, your fairness, and your judgment, then chances are if that is known, you're not going to get on uh, a AAA panel or for that matter, it's not likely you will get on any other panel. And if it is something that could be known to the parties, either through disclosure or through their search of your background on the internet, you're not going to get selected by parties, even if you are able to get on these panels. And of course, they make reference to ethical standards for arbitrators uh, and standards of conduct for mediators, all going to reputation, a part of the process of what they look for. And finally, they throw in something which is sort of a professional catch-all that you have to be committed to the ADR process. An arbitrator's demeanor reflects the arbitrator's maturity. An aspiring arbitrator's maturity level uh, would likely indicate or possibly indicate how that person would act in a hearing related process. So how should the arbitrator uh, deport himself or herself at the hearing? How should the arbitrator be viewed in the community prior to placement on a panel or selection as arbitrator uh, in terms of their demo demeanor, maturity again, reliability again? Does the arbitrator earn the respect of the parties or the colleagues or people who know him? How would that impact on how he conducted him or herself in the hearing process? Generally, I believe arbitrators should be reserved but fair, and many people look for that. Uh, arbitrators, of course, and judges generally, should avoid fraternization or ex parte involvement with the parties. And that, of course, is a part of the, the demeanor and behavior of arbitrators, which would reflect on their uh, qualification for this particular profession. And the other side of the coin, uh, again, going to reputation, arbitrators should show respect to the parties and their advocates. So therefore, uh, in terms of being selected for these association panels, you should have a reputation of being uh, a person of civility and able to get along with others in a mature manner. The process of becoming an arbitrator. Talking about the hurdles and challenges of getting on a panel and then finally getting some arbitration work. Again, as you can see, I believe that there are a number of hurdles that a potential or prospective arbitrator has to jump through. And sometimes those hurdles come at you quick, fast, and furious, and sometimes uh, it's a, a more leisurely pace, but still things to do before you can meet that qualification level to get on a panel and to be able to call yourself an arbitrator and to get work.
In terms of looking at the process, I'm going to be talking about the process I went through myself uh, when I applied to become a member of the American Arbitration Association Labor Panel. And I had been uh, a member of the American Arbitration Commercial Panel and the American Arbitration uh, Employment Law Panel for quite some time before I decided uh, back at the end of 2010 to, to uh, uh, get an appointment to the labor panel. And so the process that I'm looking at now and describing to you reflects the process that I went through uh, subsequent to 2010 to uh, become a labor arbitrator uh, for the American Arbitration Association. And happily, I can report to you, I finally got accepted on that panel uh, at some point early in 2012, and we'll talk about the timeline uh, for uh, getting on this panel and why it took me so long. And that may be helpful to you as you are trying to determine your prospects for getting on any arbitration panel. The process initiates when you write to the American Arbitration Association, most typically a regional office, and indicate that you want to apply. And then they will send you back information, uh, uh, some of which you see on the screen, uh, telling you how you need to go about that process. So if you want to become an arbitrator, either look on the internet, on the website, or probably more directly, write to the association and indicate your interest and they will send you back a packet of material uh, telling you what you need to go through to qualify for appointment to their panel. The American Arbitration Association uh, wrote me back and of course they required reference letters or letters of recommendation. And they wanted these letters from at least three active professionals in my field who were not associated with me directly. And each of these letters that they wanted from the people I identified as uh, potential references or people to recommend me would have to indicate the nature and duration of their relationship with me. In other words, how do they know me? Uh, they would have to indica indicate uh, to AAA why they thought I would be qualified to serve as an arbitrator. And there are a number of other things, and I'll, I'll take a look at what these letters of recommendation must contain in a moment. But then they suggest that, well, potential arbitrator, where do you get these letters? Well, you can get it from another American Arbitration Association panel member. They've already screened their own panel members, and probably the best place to get uh, a letter of recommendation is from someone that they have already vetted and know to a certain extent. And when I began my process, I went to a colleague I know, a fellow arbitrator, uh, Judge uh, Betty Widgen, who uh, I'd worked with on, on some matters, and uh, she was a former judge, and uh, she still was a visiting judge, but she also was an arbitrator on several panels, and she was known within the American Arbitration Association, so I asked her, Betty, will you write me this uh, letter of recommendation, the initial letter of recommendation to start the process, and she did. And she wrote that to the American Arbitration Association. And it just so happened that she was also a, uh, a former state judge. Another source of this initial recommendation letter that AAA suggests might be from an opposing counsel, if you are an attorney, or from a former employer or client. Now, I'll make this observation because uh, uh, this general area was somewhat problematic to me. I myself had been an administrative law judge the last 10 years of my career with the state, and I'd been out of that position for several years, and I'd been in a part-time law practice, and I'd been teaching, and I was still a lawyer, and so I still had this concern, somewhat of an ethical concern, and it's also somewhat of a personal concern about going back to people generally and asking for letters of recommendation or reference, especially from people that I may have been in a relationship with professionally that I didn't want to cause to lead to a conflict of some sort. So opposing counsel, I, I like to think I'm civil, 
uh, or practice civility when I, I practice law, but uh, short of going to someone who was a friend who I had uh, posed or who had uh, worked with me on many different cases, uh, that type of, of uh, reference would be difficult. Quite often I am a pretty aggressive and adversarial uh, opponent when I litigate, and there are some opposing counsel that I would uh, shudder think of the outcome if I should recommend them uh, as people to write reference letters for me. So there is this uh, continuing tension generally with the need that you have to identify professionals in your field, and later we'll see professionals in other fields, to recommend you. On this slide, we see an example of what AAA suggests would be included in an application letter that was sent to initiate the process. And basically, you can send the cover letter with your resume, and that should describe your willingness to commit yourselves, apparently, to professional arbitration. And they also are interested in knowing whether or not you are already currently serving as a neutral for any other association at that time. Now, in terms of being nominated to the American Arbitration Labor Panel, again, you don't have to be an attorney or have an advanced degree, but you must be nominated by someone, preferably who is already an arbitrator, for appointment to American Arbitration Labor Panel. Being on another organization's panels is not an automatic qualifier for a AAA appointment. And I would suggest that you need to select someone who you trust to give you a sincere, enthusiastic, and genuine letter of nomination or reference letter of support. During the process that I went through, I discovered that there were people who I can characterize as professional acquaintances or colleagues uh, who would indicate that they would write you a letter of recommendation or reference or, or whatever, but after their initial suggestion that they would be happy to do that, for whatever reason, they didn't generate the enthusiasm or the energy to do it, and you find yourself in a situation where you may have to go back to those people a time or two to remind them that they have uh, suggested that they're going to do this for you. And because these letters of recommendation that go to the AAA selection committee are uh, confidential, normally you won't see them, although I have to confess that I did see a couple of the ones that eventually got submitted for me. Uh, they were sent to me uh, by people who sent in the letters of recommendation, even though I didn't request it. But sometimes you wonder what people will say about you uh, after they smile at you, and I think you would be especially concerned if the people that you were asking to write you these letters of recommendation were not people that you actually knew on a very intimate or, or daily basis, perhaps. And as you'll see when we look at who would be required to send in these letters of recommendation, sometimes you're asked to send in letters of recommendation from people that you don't really know well yourself. You know, uh, you need uh, references or recommendation letters from people at a union or labor organization. You need uh, letters of recommendation from employers, from other adjudicators or professionals, and some of these people you may not really know on a friendship basis or on a basis where once they're not involved with you on a project or a hearing, uh, you have any idea as to who they really are. So you have to be somewhat careful there because sometimes people who you select to write these letters of recommendation for you, won't be enthusiastic. I suppose there might even be some situations where you might end up getting letters of recommendation which were adverse or negative when you were greatly surprised to find out that had occurred. Now, what the references are told uh, by the American Arbitration Association when they are contacted regarding your application. Now, first of all, I would indicate that when the process initiates, the American Arbitration Association will ask you to identify the names of the people that you want to be used as references or to write recommendation letters for you. And you give that information to the 
uh, AAA labor panel staff, and they then contact these people who you have identified as potential references. And here you see uh, a copy of the uh, type of letter or communication that goes out from AAA to the people that you have identified. And they explain, of course, that they're seeking a letter of recommendation, and they'll say that the uh, reference person's name was submitted for consideration. And here are the things that they tell the reference person that they would like to know. They want to know why the person recommending the candidate believes that the candidate would be able to uh, act in a qualified manner as a labor arbitrator. They point out, and this is a part sometimes of the delay in the process, that the application will not actually be considered or reviewed until all of the written references are received, and they're looking for written reference statements. And they're soliciting information, any information, that the person recommending you might want to give them concerning their background and training in labor relations, and they want to know if the person is aware of specific experiences with the applicant, which would qualify the applicant, in their opinion, to serve on labor cases. And, of course, to catch all and anything else that you think we would want to know. Uh, and that is, of course, a segue or a uh, solicitation for uh, information about reputation, esteem in the community, uh, this type of thing. And the information they provide is to be held in confidential, and they are encouraged not to let the applicant or neutral know what was in their reference letter. So this is how the people that you recommend for references uh, will get contacted by AAA. They tell these people uh, that they contact seeking letters of recommendation uh, about the factors that they use in determining acceptability. And by looking at this particular portion of the communication that AAA sends out, you can get, again, a reinforced view of what are the criteria for selection for appointment to these panels, what are the entry qualifications to become an arbitrator. So they're wanting to know from the people you have recommended how much experience they have in arbitration cases so that they can evaluate the quality of the recommendation. If a person has a lot of experience in labor arbitration and recommends you, that apparently would be held a different degree of acceptance than somebody who is recommending you to be an arbitrator who's never participated in an arbitration case. And they want to know if you have an assessment of whether or not they can manage a hearing. And they say with two aggressive attorneys. And it's been my experience in both litigation and in arbitration that usually when you have two attorneys, you have to aggressive attorneys. They're asking if the person has any feel or knowledge about your writing skills. Then they ask this general catch-all question about judicial temperament to run a good hearing and to make a proper ruling. And I think that's important, important. And the person that you're contacted when they're seeing this letter will be scratching their head and trying to decide how they would answer that particular question and if they have a basis for answering it. In the labor relations area, which would be pertinent to my application to become a labor arbitrator, they're wanting to know, do I understand the subject matter? In other words, do I kind of know what goes on in commercial settings where there are labor problems or issues to be resolved? Do I have good people skill? This type of thing. And then they ask if I, a person who is doing the recommendation strongly supports the application. And and here's something that is interesting, I think, that underscores another point I made. They're asking whether or not the person recommending you has an understanding or an opinion as to whether or not you are a better mediator or decision maker. And again, it's going back to that distinction between the skill sets that are necessary to adjudicate as compared to the skill sets that are necessary to facilitate or settle cases. And then again, I think underscoring the fact that you are competing not only with applicants to 
become an arbitrator on these panels, you're also competing with people who are already on the panels, would the person you are getting to recommend you regard you as a, a top choice when compared with members who are already on that labor arbitrator list? In other words, if you had a choice between Howard and some other arbitrator who is already on our panel, would you consider Howard to be as good as or better than uh, one of the people who is already on our panel? And it's kind of an interesting question, and uh, I don't quite know how people would respond to that. Uh, apparently, they responded favorably for me uh, if it was important. You should be aware of the fact when you are considering becoming an arbitrator uh, that becoming an arbitrator can impact or limit other types of work that you can do. Especially, for example, in the labor arbitration area, if you are an attorney, if you're doing something else that is involved in perhaps collective bargaining, uh, if you are providing certain types of management consultant consultation uh, relating to uh, labor relations or employment relation issues, then you may be involved in an advocacy situation which would potentially impact adversely on your ability to be neutral uh, and to provide fair and unbiased decisions. Many arbitrators only arbitrate on a part-time basis and unless they are retired and, and just doing this to supplement a retirement income, they're involved in other things and they probably don't want to be in a situation where becoming an arbitrator might preclude them from some other activity which could even be more lucrative uh, in terms of their professional well-being. There are in fact some statutes that prohibit arbitrators or people on arbitration panels from being involved in what is considered to be advocacy roles as attorneys. For example, I am on the Michigan Employment Relations Commission panel of grievance arbitrators and I'm therefore prohibited from being involved in advocacy although I have litigated and probably still continue to litigate some cases involving employment relation disputes. I do have some residual clients. I'm even in a court of appeals on some cases that started out as employment relations disputes some time ago. But looking specifically at the definition of advocacy, which appears in the rules of the Michigan Employment Relations Commission, that definition indicates that unless I am representing unions as opposed to individual non-exclusively represented uh, employees, I'm not involved in statutory advocacy. So I'm able to be on that panel and at the same time wind down these employment relations cases which are in the courts at this point in time. But be aware of that because you may or may not want to become involved in being an, ad, an arbitrator if that's going to impact adversely on your ability to do other things. I'm going to give you just a quick summary as we close this presentation of my experience uh, in the application to the AAA labor panel experience. And I highlight on this slide that the process began in October of 2010 and it ended in March of 2012. And I put on the footnote that I got my first panel assignment as a labor arbitrator from the American Arbitration Association at some point during May of 2012. And from that assignment, I'm now scheduled to arbitrate a matter. My first American Arbitration Association labor arbitrator matter at some point during November of 2012. So we're looking at a process of over two years from the time I applied to be on that panel to the time where I actually had an opportunity to adjudicate or arbitrate a labor case for AAA. I'd start out with this caveat, which you may already suspect, is the process to get admitted to the panel can be slow. And I would suggest that during that time, you're pretty much on your own. Neither the American Arbitration Association nor your colleagues, who you may be depending on to do things like provide reference letters for you, are likely to 
encourage you or attempt to expedite the application review process itself. They would be proceeding at various points in time in a much more leisurely uh, and serendipity way toward providing you with recommendations or whatever than you would want. So you have to be aware that there will be some time built into the system which you have no control over. I've already indicated that it may be difficult to get acceptable references or letters of recommendation without almost begging or taking actions which verge on being conflicts of interest. And again, coming from that background of being an administrative law judge, I had a significant amount of lack of ease approaching people who I previously had as parties before me in adjudication and asking them for letters of recommendation. And uh, the process itself, since it requires that you submit letters from people who are on the union side and people who are on the management side and people who are neutrals, it kind of requires you to go to people that you may have been in roles with before that could have been compromised if you knew that you were going to be later seeking letters of recommendation from them to enhance your own professional and pecuniary interests by being admitted uh, to another arbitration uh, association panel. Becoming an arbitrator can be an expensive proposition and although there is likely to be sure output or or expense, there is no real certain guarantee or return on investment, at least in the near term. In other words, it's going to cost you something to go through this process, and there's no guarantee you're going to get casework, and there's no guarantee that you're going to get income. References are hard to come by, and I think I've discussed this already. I did not know people in an official capacity uh, as union members or representatives of union members that I had not met in the arbitration process otherwise. In other words, they had appeared before me. People that I may have known historically, you know, 10 or 15 years ago uh, in the union side would no longer be available to write me the letters of recommendation or might not be familiar at all with who I had become or where I was at this point in time. And it was actually difficult for me to come up with the names of people that I could turn into the American Arbitration Association to suggest that these people should be contacted to write me letters of reference or recommendation. Now, I certainly am neutral. I know people on both sides. I know union people. I know management people. But this was a little bit different uh, and more difficult for me because they were asking me to go to people who had seen me in a professional capacity and require them or ask them to write me letters of recommendation. And even on the neutral side, I, I went to one person that had been uh, an employee in, in the state civil service system who had reviewed a number of uh, cases where I had appeared before the Civil Service Commission as an attorney representing a single non-exclusively represented employee. So maybe somebody had been discharged or had a difficult situation at work in the civil service setting. And so she knew my work and I considered her to be a neutral and I had often talked with her, but she was not one of my personal friends or acquaintances. Uh, she was a professional acquaintance and she certainly would have had a basis for judging my work and I'm sure she would have had uh, an understanding or had heard about the zeal and competence with which I represented my clients as an attorney but after three or four months and not getting a response back from her to the American Arbitration Association Selection Committee I asked her I said well did you get the letter from the American Arbitration Association asking you to uh, evaluate you know, my competence along these certain criteria. Uh, and she said, yes, I did. I said, well, did you see that they weren't going to consider the application until 
all the letters of recommendation had been returned. Well, yes, I did, but I don't know you personally, Howard. And, you know, and, and that had sl slowed down the process. And, and she said, well, if you want to, we can go to lunch and we can talk about it. But that, I think, was something that uh, was repugnant to me because I, I would have felt like I was compromising myself by attempting to persuade somebody to do something that they may not have been willing or wanting to do independently of my approaching them to, to pester them. So instead what I did, realizing uh, the fact that this was not someone who was going to be cooperative, although I'm confident that if she had given an honest appraisal of me it would have been satisfactory for, uh, for my purposes of getting on this panel, uh, instead I just thanked her and several months down the road in the process I submitted another potential neutral who could give me a letter of recommendation. And I ran into that type of problem two or three times. Some people that I even knew and, and was were friendly to were just not quite ready to write a letter because it looked something like work. And um, one person you know, who knew me well says, well, Howard, why don't you write the letter and I'll sign it? And that's not something I wanted to get into either. And so that person became uh, someone who was not really a, a likely candidate for a letter of recommendation. And at that point in time, I guess I was humbled to think about the fact that many people who knew me that I thought uh, would regard me highly were not really the people that you would recommend to the selection committee as people who would be endorsing you for inclusion on a professional arbitration association panel. And going one step beyond that, I, I think in terms of references being hard to come by, you know, I got the references uh, and, you know, uh, for example, the labor references, one way I did that was, you know, one of my clients was a state legislator and I went to this person, I said, well, you know, I need some people on the labor side uh, who know me to write me a letter. Can you think of who they would be? And, you know, and, and, and the letters appeared. And, you know, and I'm sure that whatever was in them, I never saw those letters, was satisfactory, and I'm sure it was, was honest. But I go through that discussion just to underscore the fact that references, which seem so easy to get, and letters of recommendation, which seem so easy to get, may not actually be something that you can get quickly. And when you do get them, depending on where they come from and how you get them, you may have put yourself in a situation of conflict of interest where you're either going to have to disclose a relationship at some future point or actually avoid cases from certain clients or groups on a prospective basis. The system is what it is, and, and I'm not saying the system is unfair. What I'm doing is just saying that basically as an aspiring arbitrator, or a person trying to get on an arbitration panel, this is one of the issues or problems that you should be aware of, and you should think about how you're going to approach it, who you would be getting to recommend you, and what they might say. I think as this particular part of the discussion uh, indicates, you during this process are seldom anyone's priority. People may agree to write you letters, that they may renege on their promises, they certainly may procrastinate, and sometimes they will even uh, hope that through their procrastination you will seek someone else to write the letters instead of them. And that does happen. And I don't know if that's a reflection on you as much as it would be a reflection on them. Again, sometimes the people that you think could recommend you may not feel they know you very well personally, and that may be their criteria for deciding whether or not they want to evaluate you professionally. Honestly, the way life is with people, there probably are some people that you might seek to uh, write letters of recommendations for you uh, or to do something for you to expedite the process who are just too busy doing their own thing. And and finally, and, and I did encounter this in some of the uh, people that I considered or approached to write letters of recommendation for me, 
if those people are already in the arbitration business or on a particular panel, such as the American Arbitration Panel, they may have some unspoken reluctance to recommend you or anybody else uh, as an addition to that panel because you might end up representing a new type of competition in the provider marketplace which they rightly or wrongly think could impact on them professionally in terms of income assignments they receive or whatever. I think bottom line I can say that there is a significant amount of competition especially among less established arbitrators. If you're going to be an arbitrator and if you want to make significant amounts of money as an arbitrator, which you certainly can do, then you're going to really be competing with other arbitrators for the business. And a part of that competition would actually be uh, in terms of getting the work. Uh, part of that competition would be in terms of, of how you're regarded within the profession. Although the demand for arbitration appears to be growing, until recently, there just wasn't that much demand for arbitrators which couldn't be satisfied pretty much with the existing stock of arbitrators who were already on the various panels and rosters. And again, many arbitrators are part-time arbitrators, and even a small decrease in their assignment load uh, would have an impact on their arbitration income, and it could have a significant impact on the quality of their lives. One thing that's very typical, no matter how many panels you get on, is that repeat assignments and referrals from agencies may be sporadic. There may be extended periods of time, even if your name is being referred out by an association uh, as a member of the roster, where you're not getting selected. And then there may be some times where you would get two or three appointments in a period of a matter of a month or two, which could be a, a fairly significant uh, appointment rate. And a final consideration which relates again to the competition among arbitrators is that you could end up being regularly rejected by parties even after you gain admission to one of these neutral association panels and those rejections could occur for a number of reasons. Moving to conclude the discussion on how to become an arbitrator or a labor arbitrator, I'm just going to point uh, and highlight some of the experience I had vis-a-vis -vis, uh, my application with this particular timeline. It's a timeline for Howard's application to the American Arbitration Association Labor Panel. And it started out about November 1st, 2010, when I first contacted the American Arbitration Association Regional Vice President to ask about the process for becoming a labor arbitrator. And she told me, uh, communicated that back to me, and then uh, about three weeks later when I was still gung-ho and eager and moving this thing as quickly as I possibly could, I had a colleague who knew me, uh, Judge Widgen, write this letter of recommendation, the initial letter of recommendation to the American Association, American Arbitration Association Vice President nominating me uh, for appointment to this panel. Three months later, I was contacted by a senior assistant, uh, a senior vice president of the American Association, uh, and that letter I received back on March 30th notified me of the fact I had been nominated, and that was the letter that requested the names of some references, and it also required me to complete uh, an American Arbitration Association labor panel supplement. It's uh, sort of a questionnaire to provide some additional information about me uh, in addition to my resume or vita. I sent that back, and I probably was responsible for some of the delay in sending that back because I spent a period of time trying to figure out who to suggest to AAA would be appropriate for letters of reference for me, but it was not until May 23rd of 2011 that the American Arbitration Association actually wrote to the people I had 
suggested and sent them the letters that you saw excerpts from in this presentation asking them to provide reference letters or letters of recommendation for me. And from May 23rd, 2011 until January 2nd, 2012, it's a period of six or seven months, I was busy going back and forth among some of those nine people uh, to obtain these recommendation and reference letters that I needed to complete the process. And as I indicated, in some cases, I went as long as three or four months before I realized that the people who had been contacted hadn't bothered to respond to AAA. And the last reference letter went in on January 2nd, 2012. And on January 19th, 2012, AAA informed me that I was formally accepted to membership in the Labor Arbitration Panel. So uh, in respect to at least AAA and this transaction, I have to say that once all of the required letters of recommendation were in, it didn't take them long to uh, underwrite me or to review my application and approve it. So on January 19th, I was formally accepted, but I was told, uh, as all new individuals, new arbitrators are when admitted to that panel, that I had to take an online Arbitrator One course. And, uh, you know, it was fortunately a relatively inexpensive course. It only cost me $125, and it took me about three hours to go through the course and complete it online. But on March 15th, I took the test after I completed the course, and I got the certificate. And at that point in time, I was qualified to receive my first American Arbitration Association appointment as a labor arbitrator. And that occurred March 15th. And within two months, I did actually get an assignment, which I am happily awaiting adjudicating at this point in time. As a final word, there are a number of pieces of material and information out there on the internet and published otherwise that I would recommend for an aspiring arbitrator. There is one book in particular, I, I bought it on the internet myself, uh, which I thought was very good and helpful and I would recommend to people. And that is a book entitled Basic Skills for the New Arbitrator. And it was written by Alan Goodman. And there you see a an image uh, from the internet of the actual uh, paperback book itself. Uh, I recommend it for you even early on if you're considering becoming an arbitrator. It not only describes the process, but it also talks about some of the issues that arbitrators will face and that you would face if you are successful in becoming an arbitrator. Extensive training is available in the field of arbitration for a price, and it will be required. And that training, again, the FMCS arbitration, uh, labor arbitration program is excellent. AAA provides some training courses, which I think are very good. And some of those are in person. Some of those are online. Uh, again, potentially expensive propositions. Most of your major panels will provide training, at least particular to their subject matter area, for example, FINRA dealing with securities regulation, arbitration, uh, provided training, which I've taken. And then again, there are annual conferences and symposia, which provide some additional training as well as networking opportunities. I recommend the Capital University Law School Minority ADR conferences, which are held annually in Columbus, Ohio at Capital University Law School. I think Professor Weatherspoon does an excellent job of getting faculty together uh, to present uh, exchange of information uh, directed primarily uh, at minority uh, professionals or people who are interested in diversity uh, in the profession. And more and more you're starting to see online and distance learning training sites. And as I indicated before, colleges and universities are also providing uh, extensive training opportunities for arbitrators and professionals in ADR. Formal training is also becoming more and more common in law school settings. Uh, you're starting to see courses in arbitration that students are taking uh, in schools and locations where you had not seen that before. 
Some colleges provide arbitration-focused coursework at both the undergraduate and graduate school level. There are a number of private sector uh, continuing legal education uh, organizations which provide introductory training and is starting to become offered pretty widely. The Institute of Continuing Legal Education in Michigan uh, is excellent and I have taken several courses which I highly recommend in the employment relations law area and also in the arbitration and ADR area which uh, have been offered by Aliaba uh, which has recently been renamed uh, the American Law Institute Continuing Legal Education Association um, and and I recommend those they're they're somewhat pricey but they're very worthwhile and of course there are many consultants and trainers like me running around trying to find someone to train and to consult with professionally and they will certainly tell you a lot some of which may be helpful well that concludes this particular presentation which I hope that you have enjoyed and I hope has been beneficial to you. I am interested in any of your feedback. Do you have questions or comments? If so, take time to either tweet me or write me an email. Uh, visit me online. I have a presence in LinkedIn and I participate in some of the groups on LinkedIn and I'd love to get into a discussion with you there. Sometimes uh, Black Gold Associates will distribute surveys related to arbitration or other social issues. And if you get one of those, certainly I would appreciate your taking time to give me feedback, fill out the survey, give me your honest, frank opinion or position. Some of you will see this presentation on YouTube. And if you do, and if you manage to get all the way through it, I know it's somewhat lengthy, uh, I would appreciate your leaving a comment, either uh, pro or con, uh, something that will help me improve the quality of uh, presentations which I may do in the future or more importantly even something that will cause me you and our colleagues to think about some of these issues and problems and processes that I have described and to enter into a dialogue with the end in sight of, of uh, mutual learning and progress and growth Again, thank you for participating, and I look forward to meeting you professionally, to hearing back from you. I'm Howard T. Spence, and I have enjoyed this time with you, and I wish you well.